Today I'm with Roy and this is going to be a very interesting interview because he recently sold his productized service, his design subscription service. So congrats Roy and thanks for joining us. Thanks Robin. Yeah, so it's been a ride, it's been a whole journey and I'm uh, happy to share my learnings that I discovered along the way. Thanks Roy again for joining us. And so for those people who don't know about Yeti, it's a design subscription service. It grew to a certain size that Roy is going to talk to us about in a moment. But before we get started, Roy, can you tell us more about, yeah, what Yeti is, what did it do and how you started it? Yeah, so basically Yeti is an unlimited uh, design subscription model. So basically in the beginning, we noticed as well, there's a high need of high quality graphic design, but it's always very annoying. So people ask for a lot of different things, whether there's logo, banners, flyers but they always have a custom pricing at that point we decided to make a subscription based model around it we build a whole platform so it becomes more scalable and more user friendly and then people can shoot in any kind of request they want then basically your designers start to work and then we deliver it sounds good and so what was the pricing for those subscriptions per month our pricing goes as follows so we have the basic plan which goes from 449 to the royal plan which is 2400 bucks per month and this really depends on how many requests you want to in have in there basic plan basically has all the static stuff wherein as the royal plan has like web design and also more advanced design categories awesome and so tell me a bit more about what type of customers use this service. Is it like more like freelancers and solopreneurs or like bigger teams, startups, like who is basically using these tools, these services? Yeah, it really depends. So in the beginning, we had a lot of agencies because agencies, they need to have like quality design work that they can deliver to their clients. And in the end, like they try to hire designers themselves and it's, yeah, they could not really scale it or sometimes need it on an occasional basis. Uh, so agencies, one, the other one is like uh, SMEs. SMEs uh, need it as well to basically support it. Most of the time the SMEs don't have like a large package. And the other hand is also a large companies to be in addition to their current team. So it really depends on the need and all, uh, especially because we deliver any kind of design. So everyone is welcome. Right. And so basically these services, some of them, I saw they position themselves as an extension of your marketing team. So would you say that most customers that use this service are like marketing teams that need different marketing assets and help basically that they cannot find in-house and they just outsource it and delegate it to subscription-based design services? Yeah, yeah, that's actually correct. That's exactly how you say it. Okay. And so a lot of people are interested in this model now because the idea is that you can generate recurring revenue and from an agency perspective, this is great because usually you have one client one month or like 10 clients one month and the next two or three months you don't have any clients. So productizing your services and offering them as a subscription is really attractive. But a lot of people promise too many services and design service also are very large. You know, you can request web design. Subscriptions. How did you kind of control the scope of services so that people wouldn't request stuff that is too difficult and that takes too much resources from your team? How did you limit that website? Yeah. So, so basically it's funny that you mentioned because my first company, my real first company was a boutique agency. So what we did was like SEO websites, we did uh, graphic design, animations, PPC, the whole shablam. So quickly I realized as well, like I have all these different skills necessary to run my business. Then I train someone and eventually someone leaves or there's, there's something happening, a person gets sick. And then in the end, I need to find a new person, need to train them and everything starts again and again. At that point, it was very, very, very hard to scale. So what I thought of is like, hey, I'm going to write down all the pain points. And one of those, there are too many different things. So I quickly discovered like my team was best in design. Also like clients didn't pay or pay too late. A good way to tackle that is basically subscription. Uh, other one as well with training and all. If you have one skill that is really, really easy to, to train because then you can build a lot of SOPs and system around there and it's easier to scale. So in this case, from my digital agency, I picked graphic design. Then I started actually Dodgetti. So I use all those learnings together, start creating the SOPs. And in the beginning, we mostly were focused on the basic package. So we didn't include any web design nor animations. And then slowly we started getting some customers and later we added those additional services once we 100% knew that everything was flowing perfectly. Yeah, and I think that's key to limit the scope at the beginning. So a lot of clients, they might ask that, can you do content writing or can you do video editing? But the problem is that if you say yes to all of those little requests, then it 
becomes operationally difficult. And the idea of a productized service is to sell the same service over and over again as if you were selling a product. So can yep. you tell me a little bit more about the beginning, how your team looked like, who were your first hires, and how big your team was as well? Yeah. So we actually, like, I bootstrapped the platform a little bit myself. So I used WordPress plugins and I used a little bit coding because I'm coding to actually uh, build a system myself. I used, I think, plugins for more like a help desk kind of thing, like a ticket service, because Everyone. if you shoot a request, you shoot in a ticket. Then I, I was fortunate that I had like a graphic designer for my agency. So that was basically directly my first employee. It was like a superstar, like a really hardworking guy. He delivered also high quality design work. Then I also use account manager for my agency. So basically there was like, I would call it the transition phase uh, between. And I don't know how we got our first uh, customer, but I just launched a website and I believe I, I put the links on some certain blogs and all. And then suddenly one client came to me and said like, the first day that we launched, he said like, okay, I want to start. And then it was a little bit panic because no one knew what to do. Uh, we didn't even have the subscription module hundred percent installed. People, yeah, they didn't know how it went, but then again, I just said, okay, let's just do it. Uh, the client dropped in the first request. I believe it was something with sandals or something like, like a summer product kind of thing. So we just designed it and yeah, the client I believe stayed also for one year. So I think we've done a great job. That's amazing. And that's great that you tell me this story because I just had an interview with Magic Design that do a design subscription for the German market. And he told me exactly the story about his first client that I can remember. Oh, wow. I still remember how my first client was like and which design they did. And at that time, they didn't well, like, yeah. have designers. He did the logo himself the whole the whole evening until like midnight or something. You can watch this interview in the description below. And yeah, basically that's that's great. My learning is always okay. just start doing stuff, right? You have a lot of people that say like one percent of the people have an idea and only one percent of the people execute it. So in that terms, is like we're missing a lot of executors. So even for me, like, because a lot of people know that I have a company come to me and they said like, oh, Roy, what do you think about this idea? And they start pitching. And then two weeks after that, they come up with a new idea. And then uh, two weeks after they come up with a new idea. So it's the same cycle. So I always just say like, okay, write down what you want to do and then just build it. Because along the way, you're going to pivot anyway, because the first idea, the first execution is never good. But even though if it goes wrong, you still have a lot of learnings from that. And then you can just keep pushing on and start learning and iterating along the way until you reach the final project. Yeah. Project. Yeah. Exactly. And I think like, even if you start your productized service, you have your first client, you don't have everything perfect. And even if the client is unhappy, you can always refund. And I saw there is a lot of productized service. They offer yeah. some warranty and they say, well, first we'll try to make it right for you. And if you if it's not right, well, we'll give you your money back. And then that's where like it's a win win. You you've tried, you had your first client, maybe some feedback, we put yep. on the next one, and then at least the client got his money back as well. Yep. And I think another thing you mentioned is that you had a prior agency. So you kind of built a team of really good uh, team players around you, and that also helped, right? The account manager, a good Oh, Oh, hundred percent. Like uh like team players are one of the most important things, right? So in that aspect, if you have like superstars around you, then uh, your company will thrive three times as fast. Like hiring is still one of the most important things. I would say it's one of the most difficult things like to find good people. Uh, but then again, it's also the same with starting a company is trial and error. Like uh, some people might seem like good from the outside, but when they start working, this is a lot of blah, blah, and they actually don't do a lot. And some people are like introvert and once you put them on the job, they're, they're skyrocketing it. So it really also with people just trial and error and you just need to find them in the wild. It's like uh, catching a Pokemon, right? Yeah. Speaking of that, like where did you hire this stuff? Like which marketplace or which websites did you use to find those? Yeah. So for me, the, the team is uh, based in the, in the Philippines. I was at that time also in the Philippines. I was living in Manila. So for me, it was easy to interview a lot of people. But after the pandemic, basically everything became remote. And in that aspect as well, like I just mostly I get them from Indeed. So Indeed is one of the best uh, job platforms, at least for me. So you can select a country and then create a local account and then you can find the people that you want. But besides that, it's also like uh, via referrals, right? So because I was there, it was also, I got recommended also a lot of people, especially like account managers and salespeople. These are much harder to find. Right. So it's 
So for like positions like sales and marketing, it was more via referrals and being in your network, somebody knew. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, after a while for designers and all this set up a whole flow. Yeah. So there is a whole funnel for designers that you set up. So first post on Indeed and then second, maybe test like interview or test task and hire. Some, some yeah. Sounds good. So yeah, that's great to know about a bit more about how you build that team and how you found the first customers. But like to go, that was from zero to one, but to go from one to 10 and then eventually we'll talk about it, selling your company. Like how did you set up? predictable marketing channels, predictable way to acquire customers. Because I think that's one of the yep. biggest struggles of people listening to this. They can find a few customers, but they cannot really find a predictable way to, to bring customers in. And I think that's something that you guys figured out. Um, so can you tell me a bit? Yeah, it's still uh, kind of difficult because the landscape changes every single year, especially when you go digital, right? So yeah, it might work like, let's say three years ago, it doesn't say that it works right now. So also for us, we went to different phases where maybe the first phase, we did some paid advertisement. We run some Google ads and there was a big search intent uh, campaigns on it. And then we saw some uh, traffic coming from that. Then also like SEO and all, but then later we noticed as well, become more a competitive market where like uh, PPC and SEO was a little bit hard to, to push through. Then we had like phase that called outreach uh, with email worked really, really well. Then at some certain point, AI came in and there's more bots and all these kind of things pushed it down again. So this is actually a constant in chase. My biggest learning is just don't become reliable on only one channel. You need to have at least two or three channels and you need to try a lot of different things. Basically, we tried everything, like even in the advertisement side, we were from Quora ads to Pinterest to LinkedIn ads to even TikTok and other job platforms because there is a need for graphic designers as well. So we tried also on job platforms and there's so many things to do, but what works now doesn't mean necessarily that it works later, right? So that's one big learning that I also want to give to you. You should at least try and never say like, okay, I already tried this. I'm not going to do it again because maybe two years down the road, all the competitors are not doing it anymore. And this is your time to shine and really try it out at that time, right? So I think it's for, for us, what we know as well, like it's, it's not an impulse buy. So it's not like, let's say like if you have a sneaker or you want to buy a baseball cap or something. It's like you show an advertisement and it looks good. Uh, the video and everything that's there is, is hyping. People purchase it maybe with one retargeting. When as like a service provider, you need to be top of mind. So basically you need to be on every single channel. You need to set up the retargeting. You need to have like an email nurture, a funnel uh, to actually be top of mind. And whenever there's a need that they basically come to you. One tip that I noticed is like focus on channels that are search intent and then try to be everywhere else. Yeah, because search intent is like lower in the funnel. They really have a high need for designers. They are looking for yeah. about job boards where they are actively looking for designers. I think that's something that worked for us. And then replying to those posts. And of course, there is the whole building a brand thing, like you say, being top of mind. And then customers yeah. start to refer you if you do a great job. So that's great. We're going to wrap up this interview with the thing that I think a lot of people are interested, which is how you sold your company. So a couple of weeks ago, Roy messaged me on Messenger and he said, Robin, I just sold my company. And I was, I told him congrats. And I was very curious. So I said, maybe we should do a podcast or like a video interview. Or anyway, let's yeah. talk about it. So I don't know anything yet about uh, that. So I'm going to let you talk a bit about that process, how you decided maybe first to start a company and how it basically it went through. So yeah, you could share that. Yeah. No, so basically, uh, me and uh, my, my business uh, partner back then and Gregory, we went to a new phase in our lives. So I just have a baby daughter. My wife was at that time pregnant, just starting to deliver. Gregory at that time just had a twin baby. We've been working on the business maybe three and a half years or so. And we felt like, okay, this is actually the right time to make move into another kind of direction. The, the company is already uh, quite stable. Everything is, is going uh, really, really well, but we're missing like big swing up. Maybe it's also because of at that time we're busy with other things. Uh, for me, it was very important. I'm a systematic guy. So what I'm really good at is creating SOPs, workflows, systems, automation to let the business run by itself. So in the end, also my workload reduced. I was working uh, less and less hours on the business and I had a lot of uh, free time. So at that time as well, I, I wanted to be with my family. I want to be there for my wife and my future daughter. 
So we made the, the hard decision about let's find uh, someone who can take over the business and actually take it to the next level. Then we went basically to a whole process, I would say, to find someone trustworthy, someone motivated, uh, someone with also enough funds, of course, and that can take over the business. Not an not easy one because then, because you can see it also as your baby, right? You've been nurturing, you've been... Uh, growing it and you need to carry it over. So at that point, we had a few conversations. We actually worked with an M&A company uh, called uh, FA International, and they helped us find suitable buyers. Props to FA, by the way, where they lined basically a couple of, of these potential buyers up. We had some interviews, a lot of hands-on conversation. I would say a, a kind of intense process where you need to deliver a lot of documents and also show like prove what you're doing and then what is your future back and forth, back and back and forth. And eventually we found the right fit, but still after that, it takes several months to actually close the deal. Yeah. Fortunately, uh, it just got closed. So we're very happy yes. yeah, with it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, how long did the whole process take from uh, deciding to list it until it was closed? Yeah. I think uh, around half a year in total. So half a year. Yeah. And uh, it's a lot of things behind the scenes. Uh, so I would say if you want to sell your business, you need to be 100% confident that you want to sell your business because there's no half work in there because it also sucks up uh, a lot of time and energy, emotions and these kind of thing of you. So you need to be really focused on your goal. Like, let's do it. Uh, yeah, you need to go for that. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you, Roy. So before we finish this interview, can you tell us a bit more about what are your plans for the future and where we can hear more and learn more about you? Yeah. So currently I'm working on CocoFest, this fractional real estate platform. I always had the interest in uh, real estate and with my background, I'm a little bit like tech slash growth hacking guy. I thought it was the right jump to go for this. So in the end, what we do, we're actually starting the first project now. <laughs> we're basically building a fractional real estate here in Thailand. What we do, we rent it out on Airbnb or like booking.com, VRBO, and then uh, people can invest any amount that they want into the property. And then we split the profit between those investors, basically. The first project starting soon, we already found a beautiful piece of land here in the middle of Bangkok. It's going to be like an urban jungle style. It's going to be awesome. I think Robin will drop the link below yeah. to show it to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, Roy. And uh, I'll also drop the link to your personal website and maybe Twitter account. I don't know if you're very active on Twitter, but I'll add all of the links. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Roy. It was a pleasure. And uh, yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you too. Take care. And I hope to see you again. See you again.